So uh, today will will be the final lecture of uh, module two, where I will be working out some practice problems. So in this module, you have studied the basics of vectors, vector spaces, and vector functions, uh, and uh, we studied some properties of vectors like linear independence and uh, dimensionality. And I'll be focusing the practice problems today on these base concepts of vectors. Okay, and we will look at more problems related to scalar and vector field in the pr problem sets of the next module. Okay, so today I'll show you some elementary problems that deal with vectors, vector spaces, and vector products, and the concepts of linear independence. Okay, so let's take the first problem. So the first problem asks you: Do the do the following vectors form a basis in three D space? Okay. So, what do you need to check for a basis? So, the condition, so in 3D space, okay, you can have only three basis vectors. Okay. Now, they can, there, are, there are many choices for basis vectors, but the conditions for them to be basis vectors is that they should be linearly independent. So, if you have three linearly independent vectors, you can choose them as a basis in 3D space. So, what you have to check is whether these vectors are linearly independent. So, R 1 2 1 0 1 1 and 1 0 0 are these vectors linearly independent. Okay, so, that is the question that we have to answer. Now, uh, in general, the way to check linear in independence is to take a linear combination of these and set it equal to 0 and see if you get a non trivial solution. So, what you will say is that you will say that you will say C1 times 1 to 1 plus C2 times 0 1 1 plus C3 times 1 0 0 equal to 0. Now, if if non trivial solutions solution exists that is c1 c2 c3 are not all zero okay then the vectors are are dependent or linearly dependent. So, what you have to do is you have to you have to set this condition and you have to check whether there exists a non trivial solution. Okay. Now, uh, this condition it is uh, actually actually the way uh, this is actually a set of 3 equations because this is a vector equation. So, so if I write out the 3 equations. So, the first equation is C 1 plus C 2 plus C 3 c 1 plus 0 c 2. So, 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 if you just look at the x component you have c 1 here, you have 0 c 2 here and c 3 here. So, this should be equal to 0. If you look at the y component then you have 2 c 1 and you have plus c 2 plus 0 c 3 equal to 0. If you look at the z component then you have c 1 plus c 2 plus 0 c 3 equal to 0. Okay. So, you have 3 equations and 3 unknowns okay. and these are uh, these are what are called homogeneous linear equations. So, the condition for there to be a non trivial solution of this okay, that is these equations. So, if I set c 1 equal to c 2 equal to c 3 equal to 0, I will I, I will automatically satisfy these equations. But is there a possibility of c 1, c 2, c 3 not all 0 that is what we have to ask. And uh, you might be knowing this, but uh, you can easily show this that uh, you evaluate this determinant. You look at the coefficients, you put them in the form of a determinant and uh, so you put 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 and you calculate this determinant. And uh, it is not hard to show this determinant is just uh, uh, 
So, it will just be 1 times 2 minus 1. So, equal to uh, 1 times 2 minus 1 equal to 1 not equal to 0. So, so, since if this determinant is not equal to 0, that means the only solution that exists is for uh, C1, C2, C3 to all be 0. So, so uh, vectors are so that would mean the vectors are are linearly independent and they form a basis okay so uh, just to recap what we did was we wanted to check whether these three vectors are linearly independent so what we did is you write the condition for linearly uh, linear independence and what you will find is that you will you, you will get the condition that this de determinant if it is 0 then the vectors are linearly dependent if it is not equal to 0 then the vectors are linearly independent ok. That means you cannot write one as a linear combination of the others ok and if you cannot write one as a linear combination of the others then these vectors will form a basis ok. And uh, it is fairly straightforward to actually just look at the three vectors and you can immediately see that uh, they are linearly independent because uh, if you look at the second vector it has no x component whereas the third vector has an x component ok and it has no y and z component ok and the first vector has all three components ok. So, clearly uh, if you I mean, I mean so, so it is clear that uh, that uh, you know you need uh, what you are checking is whether this vector can be written as a combination of these two and just by inspection you can see that that is not possible ok. So, this is the problem that has dealt with uh, linear independence ok. Now, I will give you another problem ok and uh, this is so the second problem. So, you are asked whether the vectors 0 0 1 1 0 0 minus 1, minus 1, 0 and minus 1, 5, 49 are linearly independent ok. Now, uh, the answer is no and uh, the reason is that uh, is that 4 vectors in 3 D space cannot be linearly independent. So, so if I give you a 3 dimensional space the maximum number of linearly independent vectors is 3 ok because the basis of that space is 3. So, you can never have 4 linearly independent vectors in a 3 dimensional space ok. So, without any inspection without checking anything you can immediately say that these vectors cannot be linearly independent ok. Now, the next question has to do with, um, with vector spaces and inner product spaces ok. So, uh, there are two parts. So, first is you have to check whether the set of all square integrable complex functions f of x forms a vector space. I will just put a star in this definition. So, what you have to see is whether the set of square integrable complex functions forms a vector space ok. Now, uh, uh, actually, actually, this is not a real vector space. This is what is called a complex vector space. But, but we'll just check uh, whether these axioms are satisfied. So, uh, if you want to check whether the set of certain functions forms a vector space, okay, then uh, what you have to do is to check whether, given f and g belonging to the vector space V is C 1 F plus C 2 G contained in V ok. So, if you take any linear combination of this, this is also contained in the vector space. So, that is essential that is essentially the most important condition to check ok. Now, uh, now uh, a square integrable function in a complex space satisfies so, so, square integrable implies integral f star 
f dx and uh, we will just take a one dimensional space. So, from minus infinity to plus infinity this should be greater than equal to 0 and less than infinity ok. Why this should this should be greater than 0 because f star f is positive ok and uh, if it is less than infinity then you say that the function is square integrable ok. So, so now let us uh, check whether that forms a vector space. So, what you have to do if you have two functions ok that are square integrable then is a linear combination of them also square integrable ok. So, so what you have to check is whether given f g are square integrable is c 1 f plus c 2 g also square integrable. Okay. So, is this also square integrable and this is what you have to check. Okay. So, so, how do you check this? So, you calculate c 1 f plus c 2 g take a complex conjugate then you take c 1 f plus c 2 g and you do this integral d x from minus infinity to infinity and you have to check whether this is less than infinity ok. So, so what you will get is that uh, this will be uh, c 1 square integral f 1 star f d x plus c 2 square integral f 2 star uh, or g star should be g star uh, c f, f, f star f and this should be g star g g star g d x ok. Now, remember c 1 square is c 1 star times c 1 ok. So, uh, these are the two things I am not I am not bothering putting the limits here. And then you will have cross terms that look like uh, c 1 c 2 or I will write it as c 1 c 1 star c 2 integral f star g d x plus c 1 c 2 star integral f g star d x ok. Now, uh, now, the first two terms are clearly less than infinity or since uh, the, it is square integrable f f star f will be less than infinity g star g into integral of g star g and integral of f star f will both be less than infinity. So, so uh, the first two terms are clearly less than infinity. What about the third term? So, the third term satisfies. So, what you notice is that the third and fourth terms are just complex conjugates of each other and if you take a number and add its complex conjugate ok. Then what you will get is that uh, is that uh, you will just get the real part of that number ok. So, so I can write this as I can write this as the real part of c 1 star c 2 integral f star g d x ok. And now, uh, now, uh, actually, actually, we will see this in a minute. Uh, there is a condition that uh, there is a there is an inequality called the Schwartz inequality. Which uh, basically says that integral f star g dx okay, is uh, is less than or equal to. So, the abs absolute value of this is less than or equal to the square root of integral f star f d x times integral g star g d x ok. We will show this in the in the next problem, but the basic idea is that this 
this integral this uh, where you have f star and g is basically less than the product of f star f and g star g and uh, under the square root sign. Now, each of f star f and g star g is less than infinity. So, therefore, f star g into integral f star g dx has to be less than infinity. Okay? So, so, what you get is that uh, this whole thing, this whole, uh, whole thing is less than infinity because each of these terms are individually less than infinity. So, so basically if f and g are square integrable, this is also square integrable. Okay. So, uh, with this you can basically show that uh, this is a valid uh, vector, this forms a vector space. Okay. Now, uh, the next problem is to check whether, whether the inner product defined this way is a valid definition of the inner product. Okay. So, whether the inner product defined this way is a valid definition of the inner product and again you can show this easily. You can show that uh, if uh, the two condition for validity of inner product is that is that f f times f an inner product of f with itself okay so this uh, implies inner product of f with itself should be greater than or equal to 0 okay and again you can easily see that okay the other condition is that uh, inner product of f with g should be equal to inner product of g with f Okay. Now, now uh, this is true for a real inner product space. For a complex inner product space, actually this is modified with a star. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, this is th these two conditions you can easily see again from this uh, from this definition of inner product. So, this is a valid inner product. Now, uh, I just I just want to mention one thing why why I chose this complex. Uh, uh, vector space. The reason I chose this complex vector space is that this thing is something called a Hilbert space. So this space is called a Hilbert space and uh, this is the this is the vector space in which in which uh, the entire uh, uh, entire mathematics of quantum mechanics is, is performed. So, the entire your your entire uh, mathematical aspect of quantum mechanics works on this Hilbert space, which is not quite a real inner product space, but it is a complex inner inner product space. Okay. Now the next question. Okay. So so just to emphasize, I'll just emphasize this here that uh, Hilbert space is a complex vector space and uh, inner product satisfies f g equal to g f star okay and uh, f g is given by integral f star g dx and this is given by integral g star f dx. Okay. So, the Hilbert space is actually uh, this complex vector space where the inner product is defined in this way. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and this is, this is uh, essential in quantum mechanics. Okay, so next uh, next practice problem is to prove the Schwarz and triangle inequality for the inner product as Q and below. So, what is the Schwarz inequality and what is the triangle inequality? Okay, and uh, we'll prove this in general. So, I'll just tell you what the Schwarz inequality is. So, the Schwarz inequality okay so for any inner product for 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 any inner product space and for uh, any inner product the schwarz inequality basically says that if i take an inner product of fg that should be less than or equal to square root of ff and gg okay so a cross inner product is always less than the product of the individual inner products uh, uh, the the norms pr product of the norms okay uh, so that is the 
so so in other words i can write this as is less than or equal to norm f into norm g okay so this is the schwartz inequality the triangle inequality okay this is like saying that the that the sum of lengths of two sides of a triangle should be greater than or equal to the length of the third side okay so so in terms of vector spaces so what it says is that f plus g in a product with f plus g okay this should be strictly less than or equal to f in a product with f plus g in a product with g okay and uh, yeah all this should be under the square root no in other words norm of f plus g should be less than equal to norm of f plus norm of g okay so this is the this is a triangle inequality and what we are going to do is we are going to go ahead and show both these inequalities okay now uh, there are many ways to prove the schwarz inequality the one common method that is used is that is to is to actually choose uh, is to is to use the idea use norm of any any function norm of any function should be greater than equal to 0 so the, so in the definition of the inner product one of the conditions is that norm of any function should be greater than 0 okay then what i'll do is i'll choose h is equal to f minus g times f comma g divided by g comma g so i just took i just took a particular form of uh, form of h okay and and now and now if you calculate h comma h okay you will get it as if you if you write it out okay so if so you'll get this in a product with itself okay and uh, what you will get is f minus g f g divided by g g comma f minus g f g by g g okay you can unfold these brackets and you can multiply them term by term what you will get is h comma h is equal to f comma f minus so uh, you'll get you'll get one term that takes inner product of this with it with these two terms okay so so if i take the inner product of these two terms i'll have gg and then fg fg twice okay so so now one of the ggs will cancel so i'll have f times g into f times g divided by g times g okay and then and then i'll have i'll have two cross terms so uh, this multiplied by this, so so f times g and uh, and then and then i'll have the same thing here so i'll have my uh, okay this is the plus sign and i have minus 2 f times g f times g divided by g times g notice that uh, this particular choice of h ensured that these two terms the second and third terms are basically the same so so what you get is f comma f so this is these two are the same so so what i get is minus f comma g whole uh, whole square divided by g comma g and this because it is a it because it is a it is a norm of h so this should be greater than or equal to 0 okay and that that immediately implies f comma g whole square should be less than or equal to f comma f times g comma g and this is schwartz inequality Okay. 
So, so we have proved the Schwarz inequality. Next, we'll prove the triangle inequality. So, to prove the triangle inequality, uh, you you take you take our let's look at our expression for the triangle inequality that we had here. So, this is the expression for the triangle inequality: square root of f plus g f plus g is less than this. Now, if I square both sides, okay, then what I'll get is the following. So, f plus g f plus g. So, so this on the left hand side and on the right hand side, okay. So, so we have to check is this less than or equal to f comma f. So, so, so I have the norm of, I have, so if I square the right hand side, I will get this term square plus this term square plus the cross term, okay. So, so f star f, uh, so f comma f plus g comma g plus twice square root of f f g g okay and uh, so so the question is is this less than this okay now uh, now again again you can open this so 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 if you if you if you if you expand the left hand side you will get f comma f g comma g and twice g comma f so what you have to prove is that is twice f comma g less than equal to twice square root of f f g g if this is true then you satisfy the triangle inequality okay now clearly clearly uh, f comma g is less than equal to square root of f comma f times g comma g from Schwartz inequality. Okay, that, that is just up here. So, we just showed this here. So, if you just take square root on both sides, you will get exactly this expression. So, this implies this implies that, uh, that uh, th this equality holds okay and uh, and it implies that uh, this inequality also holds so therefore this implies triangle inequality holds okay so um, so what we have showed is that the schwarz inequality and the triangle inequality they hold for any arbitrary inner product space and we have we have restricted to real inner product but you can do the corresponding for the hilbert space also okay so i'll stop here